And now please turn with me in God's Word to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, and we start at verse 18. Last week we heard from the previous passage how the Lord brought back to life again the son of the widow of Nain. And now we start at verse 18 and our text will be the verses 18 to 23. The disciples of John reported to him about all these things. Summoning two of his disciples, John sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the expected one, or do we look for someone else? When the men came to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you to ask, Are you the expected one? Or do we look for someone else? At that very time, he cured many people of diseases and afflictions and evil spirits, and he gave sight to many who were blind. And he answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up. The poor have the gospel preached to them. Blessed is he who does not take offense at me. When the messengers of John had left, he began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Those who are splendidly clothed and live in luxury are found in royal palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and one who is more than a prophet... This is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. I say to you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet, he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. When all the people and the tax collectors heard this, they acknowledged God's justice, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves, not having been baptized by John. To what then shall I compare the men of this generation, and what are they like, says Jesus they are like children who sit in the marketplace and call to one another and say, We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you would not weep. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine. And you say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. And you say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet, wisdom is vindicated by all her children. Amen. So we take the first half of what you have just heard, my brother and sister, and that will be the text of this morning's sermon. The other half we plan to have this afternoon. Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, do you sometimes doubt in Jesus Christ? Do you doubt that He is indeed the only way to God? That He really is who He claimed to be? 
Do you at times doubt that the Bible, the Old and New Testament, is true? And if you doubt, are you too scared to even admit your doubting? Too scared that admitting your doubt might make it even more of a reality for you? Well, our passage teaches us that a period of doubt in the believer's life can actually turn for the good of his faith. Provided, provided that he would contemplate the reasons of his doubt and turn to Jesus Christ with his doubt. So here is the main message of our passage. Believer, do you doubt? Well, then turn to Jesus. He understands. He will not punish you. He will graciously remove your doubt. Our passage allows for us the following three points. Doubt. Doubt graciously removed. And blessing. So first then, doubt. It's still early in Jesus' ministry, but he has already performed many miracles, the latest of which was the raising of the dead young man at Nain. Meanwhile, as Jesus is busy performing all these miracles, John the Baptist sits in prison. Eight kilometers east of the Dead Sea. It seems he has been there for quite some time already. And he is in this prison because he has rebuked the king for his immoral lifestyle. Well then, one day, some of John's disciples come to visit him in prison and tell him of these mind-bending miracles Jesus is performing. Next, we see two of John's disciples come to Jesus out in the field in Galilee. And this is what they say. John the Baptist has sent us to you saying... Are you really the one who was to come? Or shall we expect another? Well, some commentators have argued it's impossible for John the Baptist to have doubted. He could not possibly doubt in Jesus. John was then the God-appointed forerunner of the Christ. He knew exactly who Christ was. Surely there's no way that John the Baptist could have doubted in Jesus. And so these commentators say that John sent these two disciples to Jesus for their sakes. Because they, these two disciples, were doubting in Jesus. Well, that is wrong. For our text clearly reveals how Jesus tells these messengers, Go and tell John. In verse 22, Besides, is it impossible for even the greatest of Old Testament prophets to doubt? I mean, was not Moses ready to quit on one occasion when he said, God, where will I find meat for this people? Lord, kill me at once. And did not Elijah, whose name, by the way, John the Baptist also bore, become afraid as well as sick and tired of bringing God's word to the people. And then he went into the wilderness and sat down under a broom tree asking that he might die. And did not Jeremiah, 
under severe pressure, want to quit working for the Lord? Remember what Jeremiah said? I have become laughingstock all the day. Everyone mocks me. My brother and sister, one could go on and on, citing examples from the Bible of how in times of distress and trouble, even the prophets and the apostles of the Lord had moments of doubt and confusion. And so, John too. Yes, every day as he wastes away in this awful prison, he must be wondering, where is Jesus? Did I make a mistake? Do you want to tell me that every time I proclaimed Jesus to be that Lamb of God, I was wrong? John can't stand this anymore. And now there are these reports coming in. Reports of Jesus' miracle and his power. If Jesus is so powerful, why then does he not do something about my imprisonment? What's more, why is Jesus' message so different from the one I used to proclaim? Yes, why is Jesus' message so filled with grace and compassion? So unlike mine, which talks of coming judgment, I announced Jesus then as the one who had to come and punish and destroy. My brother and sister, let's not make a mistake. Every word that John had proclaimed about Jesus was indeed true. It was the very word of God. However, what he as Christ's herald missed was that this prophecy of judgment would go into fulfillment, not now, but at Christ's second coming. Yes, John did not see the present and the future in their, two, in their true perspectives. He blurred them. And so John can't stand it anymore. So finally he sends two of his disciples to Jesus to ask. But tell us now, are you the one who was to come? My brother and sister, do you know how many millions of people who are on this planet today and also here in New Zealand are not persuaded that Jesus was and is the one? I mean, there's nearly the whole Jewish nation still waiting for the Messiah. They rejected Jesus, for they were convinced that he was not the one who was to come. And then there is Islam. Every Muslim on this planet believes that Jesus ultimately was not the one to come. And then there are still some other people who are looking for a hero, an idol. Yes, anybody that could fulfill the role of a rescuer, of the deliverer, of the savior. All these people are also not satisfied with Jesus. And then there are many, many people, sadly, way too many, who believe that Jesus was just one of the ones who was to come, but by no means the only one. These people will acknowledge that Jesus is our way to God, but they get angry at the very idea that he is the only way to God. Sadly, some of those in this last category, liberals, sit in God's church. And they dare preach this message even at funerals and weddings. Even using as their text a twisted version of Jesus' words of John 14 verse 6. 
I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I have personally heard such a preacher at a funeral say these words. Jesus did not mean that he is the only way to the Father. How shocking that this preacher then not read the word except. My brother and sister, you and I live smack in the middle of a secular post-Christian culture in which people quite arrogantly say, there are many ways to God. Well, if there are many ways to God, then surely Jesus isn't one of them. Because as Jesus said, he was the only one. And the word of God says, he is the only one. The word of God says, one mediator between God and man. 1 Timothy chapter 2. There's only one who has given himself as a ransom for all. And if someone thinks that God is miserly or stingy and lacking in grace by restricting it to only one way, then you need to ask yourself the question, why is there any way at all? What have we done that we would merit God's love? Yes, that we would move God to provide any way of salvation. But in his glorious grace, he has given to us only begotten one of the Father. Well, why knew a church member and visitor? Who is Jesus for you? Is he the only Savior, the only mediator between God and man? John the Baptist doubts. At times, under pressure of trial or mocking, you and I doubt. Well, may we in our doubting moments do what John did. Turn to Jesus. Which brings us to point two. Doubt graciously removed. My brother and sister, John's messengers arrive at exactly the right time. And that is when Jesus was, as our text says, healing many people. Just when Jesus is showing his healing power, his compassion, and his love. Just at the right time they came. So decreed by God. And if we look at those healings listed in verse 21, then we see that Jesus heals three classes of people. The sick, the demon-possessed, and the handicapped. And just then, here come John's messengers asking, Jesus, John has sent us to ask you, are you the one who was to come, or should we wait for someone else? Amazingly, Jesus does not show sadness about this question. Neither does he explode in anger. But in great patience, he answers John's messengers. And don't you just love the way Jesus answers them? You see, Jesus could have answered their question with a clear and firm Yes, you go tell John, yes. But my brother and sister, what would that have helped? Would John have believed such an answer? No. So Jesus gives him the best answer, the answer which gives the evidence 
he says in verse 22, Go and tell John what you have seen and what you have heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up. Wow, the dead are raised up. And here, so you feel, Jesus' list of good deeds should have ended. He is here with the mention that the dead are raised up, just like Jesus recently did in the town of Nain when he raised that young man from the dead. Here, the list should have stopped. Because what a climax it is. Surely, here Jesus' words to the messengers must end. For what greater work can there be than raising the dead? But no, Jesus knows better. And so he adds, but also go tell John, the poor have the good news preached to them. And that's the greatest work of all. The poor, that means those who are poor in spirit, of which many were financially poor anyway. They are hearing and they are receiving the good news of how they are made eternally right with God through the sacrifice of his very own son. You say, but preacher, what an answer is this to John? He asked Jesus, are you the one who was to come or should we expect another? And Jesus does not say, yes, I am the one. Instead, Jesus says, go and tell John what you've seen, what you've heard. You say, does John not already know about all these things? About Jesus' miracles? Did his disciples, they not tell him what Jesus is doing? Of course they did. The answer is yes. John knows what Jesus is doing. But this time, Jesus, and not John's disciples, is phrasing this answer for John. And Jesus phrases it as exact quotes from the Jewish scriptures, from the Old Testament. Jesus literally quotes memory verses from the Old Testament scripture for John. Memory verses regarding the Messiah who was to come. Indeed, when Jesus says, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, and the deaf hear, he is giving an almost word-for-word -word quote of the messianic prophecy from Isaiah 35, verse 5 and 6. And when Jesus says, the poor have the good news preached to them, he is again quoting from the messianic prophecy of Isaiah 61, verse 1. Surely, when John's messengers return and quote these verses back to John, he will understand, he will click that Jesus, instead of saying to him, yes, John, I am the one who was to come, is giving live and true evidence that he is indeed the one who was to come. It's as if Jesus were tenderly saying to John, John, do you remember these prophecies I'm just quoting to you now? Then see, the Old Testament prophecies do not just predict that I'm coming to judge. No, as part of my job description, they also say that healing and preaching the good news will be fulfilled in me. Do you doubt, John? Then, dear John, read your Bible and see, I am indeed fulfilling the prophecies concerning Messiah. I am the one. I am the only Messiah. Why no we member, visitor, do you doubt that Jesus is the one who was to come? 
Well, read your Bible. Study again the Old Testament. And then study the New Testament. Yes, look again, for example, at Psalm 16, verse 15. Psalm 22, several verses in that psalm. Psalm 118, Isaiah 53, and many others. Yes, also see how Jesus is the fulfillment of the whole Old Testament sacrificial system and how Jesus is the ultimate prophet, priest, and king. So very graciously, without any anger or even impatience, Jesus removed the doubt for his loved one, for John. He does the same with you and me. When we come to him with our doubt. Well, that was point two. Brings us to the last and smaller point. Blessing. My brother and sister, hear how our Lord finishes his answer to John in verse 23. John, and blessed is he who does not take offense at me. What a gentle rebuke. Jesus does not scold or condemn John for his doubt. No, Jesus encourages this wavering John to cling on to him, to cling on to Jesus, for he is the Messiah. And how does Jesus encourage John? By promising a blessing. Yes, by giving him a beatitude. Blessed is he who does not take offense at me. Who does not see me, Jesus, as your stumbling block. And so the Lord treats John as tenderly as he did those who were sick. As he did the woman caught in adultery. As he treated traitor Peter and doubting Thomas. Why? Well, for John is one of the Lord's elect, one of the Lord's loved ones. My brother and sister, why is it that professing Christians are so hesitant to say and live that Jesus is the only way? Is it because they know what the world thinks about such a statement? That to hear that Jesus is the only way is utterly offensive to them? So what do Christians do? I love how one preacher answers this question. He says, they try to flee from the offense. Yes, from Jesus Christ, the stumbling block. And so Christians answer, Well, Christ is right for me. But whatever you believe, well, that's right for you. You pray to your God, and I'll pray to mine, and we'll happy together. And then adds this pre preacher, We'll be happy together, yes, in hell. And so these Christians take offense at Jesus how different it is with Christian martyrs. Remember, for example, just John Haas, the Czech reformer whom the Roman Catholic Church burned alive in 1415. Haas would not recant that Christ and not the Pope is the head of the church and that we are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. And so on the 6th of June, 1415, as John Huss was being led to the stake to be burned, he said, among other, in the truth of the gospel, I have written, I have taught, and I have preached. Today I will gladly die. So Huss did not take offense at Christ. Are there any John Husses here? in this building today. Having said that, our Lord does not expect of you and me to bash people with the gospel. 
After all, the gospel is never forced down people's throats. Instead, it is brought by humbly, yet firmly preaching and bringing the word. And in love, and in care, and in compassion, if needed, even accompanied by deeds of love. My brother and sister, may that be you and I. Amen.